Ozymandias by Percy Bysshe Shelley I met a traveller from an antique land who said Two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert Near them, on the sand, half sunk a shattered visage lies whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read which yet survive stamped on these lifeless things the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. Hi. Welcome to Lit Poetry and our discussion today of the poem Ozymandias by Percy Bysshe Shelley. Shelley was born in 1792 in Sussex, England and died in 1822 at the age of 30 in a boating mishap off the coast of Italy. As a romantic poet, Shelley's passionate search for personal love and social justice was gradually channeled into poems that rank with some of the greatest ever written in the English language a radical in his poetry as well as in his political and social views. Shelley did not see fame or popularity during his lifetime, but recognition for his writing grew steadily following his death. Shelley became an important member of a close circle of visionary poets and writers that included the likes of Lord Byron, John Keats and his own second wife, Mary Shelley, author of the famous novel Frankenstein. As a writer, while Shelley's output remained steady throughout his short career, most publishers and literary journals of the time declined to support his work for fear of being arrested. This was because Shelley was seen by authorities of the time to be aligned with controversial and radical thinking. Following his death, however, and with his steadily increasing readership, Shelley's political views, and in particular his advocacy for nonviolence, started to have a significant effect on later generations of writers and thinkers, including people of the ilk of Karl Marx and Mahatma Gandhi. In addition to his radical political views as a romantic poet, Shelley was also very interested in the sublime power of nature and the connection of that power to both individuals and to art itself. The poem Ozymandias speaks to Shelley's interest in exploring these themes and ideas. It is interesting to note that several years after the publication of Ozymandias, Shelley published a pamphlet entitled A Philosophical View of Reform in which he called for an end to tyranny and discussed the history of empires crumbling over time. Ozymandias itself had an interesting genesis as a poem. Shelley and his friend and fellow writer Horace Smith challenged each other to write about Ozymandias and his destroyed statue in the deserts of Egypt. After reading about this statue in a description written by the ancient Greek writer Diodorus Siculus. The name Ozymandias of course is ancient Greek um, and it comes from a reference to the Egyptian pharaoh Ramses II. Siculus described the pedestal of the real life statue as containing an inscription that read King of Kings I am Ozymandias 
If anyone would know how great I am and where I lie, let him surpass one of my works. Here, it is really interesting to note that in retelling this an already told story, Shelley does in fact take up Ozymandias' challenge. And history now attests that his poem has perhaps become as well known, if not more so, than the great and mighty Pharaoh himself, confirming the adage, the pen is mightier than the sword. Ozymandias is written in the form of a sonnet. A traditional sonnet is a poem made up of 14 lines of iambic pentameter. However, while Ozymandias uses the 14 requisite lines, it is not entirely written using iambic pentameter. Indeed, Ozymandias goes on to play with and break the sonnet form in several very, very subtle ways. In addition to changes in meter, the poem also adopts an unconventional rhyme scheme that doesn't adhere to typical Shakespearean or Petrarchan sonnets of the time, and they were the two major types. A normal Shakespearean sonnet, for instance, follows an A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F pattern of rhyming throughout its first 12 lines, ending with a G, G rhyming couplet. A Petrarchan sonnet, on the other hand, consists of initial octave of eight lines using an A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A scheme, followed by a sestet of six lines arranged in a C, D, E, C, D, E, or a C, D, C, D, C, D rhyming pattern. And, and these patterns, these types of patterns were very strong conventions back in Shelley's time when he was writing that most poets were inclined to obey and pay some sort of homage to. In Ozymandias, however, Shelley has put an extra and irregular A rhyme and an extra E rhyme in line 13. While the poem still contains many of the hallmarks of both Shakespearean and Petrarchan sonnets, it goes its own way. This breaking of poetic conventions can be read as an echo of the broken work of art, the statue that the poem Ozymandias is actually describing, and that is very fascinating. Like the, the broken statue, the rhyme scheme is broken too. It's a decayed version of the ideal form. This is clearly very masterful writing. Note also that the poem plays with its rhymes in another subtle way. A number of its rhymes are actually what are commonly referred to as kind of watered down, but referred to specifically as slant rhymes, and come across as somehow broken and crumbling as well, much like the statue. Look at the slant rhyme of the words stone and frown in lines two and four. And then the words appear and despair in lines nine and 11. They're not pure rhymes in themselves and this really has an interesting impact on the poem. Together, these changes to the traditional rhyme scheme and the use of slant rhymes heighten the similarities between the poem and the statue that it describes as both are works of art that appear to be broken and missing pieces, and yet both still endure despite the passing of time. This same phenomenon of brokenness also applies to the poem's meter and rhythm. A sonnet is, after all, ideally meant to conform to iambic pentameter, in which lines are ten syllables long with an alternating unstressed stressed pattern. For instance, line nine of the poem is a perfect iambic pentameter line, and on the pedestal these words appear. However, the meter of the poem shifts at times and becomes irregular, and this creates certain hmm, desired effects that the poet actually wants to embed into his, his poem. For instance, in line two, there are the words too vast that emphasizes the immensity of the statue's legs. And these are written in a stressed, stressed manner. Who said too vast and trunkless legs of stone. Similarly, the third line begins not with the expected I am, the unstressed stressed, 
but with a stressed, unstressed trochae before returning to IAMs for the rest of the line. Stand in the desert, near them on the sand. The trochae puts the stress on stand, emphasising the strange sight of these two legs and nothing else sticking up out of the flat desert. In line seven, Shelley emphasises the word stamped using, again, a stressed, unstressed trochae, yet which survive, stamped on these lifeless things. The caesura of the comma in this line helps to break up the metrical pattern even more to emphasise the word stamp, which in turn highlights the way that the, the sculpture's artistic talent permanently captures the traits of Ozymandias, such that they have endured through time when everything else that Ozymandias created has disappeared. And in this clever line, we perhaps also get you know, a bit of a hint of how Shelley's own artistic talent, which is exemplified in his use of Sejura and Change Meter, can also create an enduring work of art. And finally, in lines 10 and 11, the poem again plays with Meter. My name is Ozzy Mandias, King of Kings. Look at my works, ye mighty and despair. But I might leave you to ponder and unravel and contemplate the meaning of the meter in this line. Enjambment. Shelley uses enjambment, which involves a string of words stretching across the boundary of the end of one line and into the beginning of the next, to have his lines echo the stretching out of time or sand that his words actually describe. This use of enjambment occurs first in line two, when describing the statue's legs that are still standing despite the passage of time. The fact that the content of the line stretches to the next mirrors the way that the legs themselves have also endured through time. The poem also uses enjambment towards the end of the poem in lines 12 and 13. Once again, this use of enjambment seems to support the idea of vastness and the passage of time. But these lines describe not the survival of a human structure, such as a statue, through time, but rather the boundless desert that has swallowed up all remnants of Ozymandias' empire other than the statue. It is also worth noting that lines 12 and 13 are the only two consecutively enjambed lines in the poem, which suggests that the endurance of the desert is even more powerful than the endurance of any human achievement, and will in the end wear all traces of humanity away. Alliteration. Shelley uses alliteration most frequently in the poem to enact the all-encompassing nature of the sand. For instance, the S sound that he uses dominates line four half sunk a shattered visage lies a hissing sound like the sound of something slowly sinking under sand is appearing in this line the alliterative sound Shelley uses to describe the sand in other parts of the poem similarly the desert is boundless and bare lone and level and the sands stretch this dense alliteration in so few lines likewise enhances the monotony of the endless sand that has swallowed up Ozymandias' empire. Power and impermanence. Ozymandias explores power through arguing that both mighty rulers and their empires will fail with the passing of the sands of time. The reality that Ramses II, the king of kings, achievements lie crumbling in a far-flung desert indicates that no amount of strength, power or fortitude can weather the pitiless and ceaseless passage of time. The poet uses the speaker in the poem to describe how time not only demolished the statue, it also basically destroyed the entire kingdom the statue was built to proclaim. 
The king's declaration found on the pedestal of the statue, look upon my works, ye mighty and despair, is followed with the line, nothing beside remains. Such a brutal juxtaposition makes the, the king's arrogant proclamation almost comically naive. Ozymandias believed his achievements would stand forever, as would his intimidating reputation, but his words are ultimately empty. As everything he built has turned to rubble, the domain he controlled and subjugated to his will are gone, leaving only an abandoned desert whose lone and level sands leave barely a trace of the kingdom's former glory. The pedestal's warning that onlookers should lose heart at Ozymandias' works thus develops a, a deeply ironic meaning as the reader does not despair at Ozymandias' power, but instead the reader comes to bear witness to how even the mightiest of people are, as Shakespeare would like to say, but walking shadows and poor players on the stages of history. The poem Ozymandias famously describes how the ruined king's statue boastfully commands onlookers to look on my works, ye mighty, and despair, even though there are no great works left to actually sit in awe of. Ozymandias' kingdom, authority, and power have all vanished, and nothing beside the shattered statue and its pedestal remains. There is one thing that actually has survived, though, through the centuries, and that is art. The skillful construction of the statue itself and the words chiselled alongside it have survived long after Ozymandias and his world turned to decay. And through this, Shelley's poem argues that art is perhaps the most enduring tool in preserving humanity's legacy, not might or power. While the statue is in a state of decay and a wreck, its individual pieces show the skill of the sculptor and preserve the story of Ozymandias. The face is, is shattered, leaving only a mouth and nose above the desert sand, but the frown, the wrinkled lip, the sneer clearly show Ozymandias' passions, that is, his pride, tyranny and disdain for others. The fragments interpret and preserve the king's personality and show onlookers what sort of man and leader Ozymandias truly was. These fragments, then, are examples of art's unique capacity to capture and communicate an individual's character even after their death. It's amazing. Moreover, the poem clearly emphasises art's ability to bring personalities to life. The speaker explains that Ozymandias' passions yet survive on the broken statue despite being carved on lifeless stone. Ozymandias may be dead, yet thanks to the sculptor who read those passions and mocked him, basically, or made an artistic reproduction of them, his personality and emotions live on. In addition to highlighting the sculptor's artistic skill, Shelley's poem also elevates the act of writing through its focus on the inscription of, that we see on the statue's pedestal. The pedestal preserves Ozymandias' identity even more explicitly than the statue itself. The inscription reveals his name, his status as royalty, king of kings, and his command for mighty onlookers to despair at his superiority and strength. His words are thus a lasting testament to his hubris, his pride. Yet it is notable in some ways that only the words themselves survive rather than the threat behind them. That's really interesting. Without this inscription, none would know Ozymandias' name, nor the irony of his final proclamation. In other words, his legacy and its failure only exist because of a work of art, specifically a written work, preserve them. The poem therefore suggests art as a means to immortality. While everything else disappears, art, even when broken and half buried in the sand, can carry on humanity's legacy. This power of art is reflected by the composition of the poem itself. The very composition of this poem dramatises the power of art. And in doing so, Shelley shows how art can preserve people, objects, cities, 
and empires, giving them a sort of immortality and letting future generations look on past works, not with despair, but with wonder and perhaps wisdom even. As a romantic poet, Shelley was profoundly deferential to nature and suspicious of mankind's effort to rise above it. Fittingly, Ozymandias isn't just a discussion about the fleeting nature of political force, it is also an affirmation of humankind's ineptitude when compared to the might of the natural world. The sculpture the sonnet depicts has likely become a colossal wreck on account of, of the tireless powers of sand and wind disintegrating it in the desert over time. This joined with the way that the lone and level sands have assumed control over all the vast kingdom the sculpture arrogantly proclaimed, illustrates nature as a truly mighty force to which humans are ultimately subservient. Shelley's imagery suggests a natural world whose might is far greater than that of humankind. The statue is notably found in a desert, a landscape hostile towards life. That the statue is trunkless suggests sandstorms eroded the torso or buried it entirely, while the face being shattered implies humanity's relative weakness. Even the destruction of a hulking piece of stone is nothing for nature. The fact that the remains of the statue are half sunk under the sand, meanwhile, evokes a kind of burial idea. In fact, the statement, nothing beside remains, can be read as casting the fragments of the statue as the remains of a, of a corpse. The encroaching sand described in the poem suggests that nature has steadily overtaken a once great civilization and buried it, just as nature will one day reclaim everything humanity has built, and every individual human as well. The desert, not Ozymandias, is accordingly the most impressive despot or tyrant in Shelley's sonnet. The desert is boundless and stretches far away. It has subjugated everything the eye can see, including the now mocked and ridiculed statue of Ozymandias. Ozymandias might be a mighty king of kings, but even rulers can be brought down by the simple grains of sand over time.